figure out what you're interested in. But uh, I remember when I was in your shoes, I had no idea. I played baseball here, so that was pretty cool. Uh, but I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated, other than playing at my computer games and stuff like that. So, you know, I had to go to work. Uh, I went to a job fair. Do they still have job fairs? All right, good. I recommend. We have one this semester. Oh, good. Make sure you get there. Um, and we might be there, actually. Maybe we should do that. Um, I walked through. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I'm literally walking, just kind of looking at the different booths and companies, and I see wine. And it was the EJ Gallo wine. Do they still recruit here? Do you guys see them at all? Great, great company. But I said, you know what? I like wine. I'll go talk to them. <laughs> and that's really how it started. Um, got to talking to them, went through a whole interview program out of the LMU um, system, out of the job fair here. And there was a management development program that they had where they flew us up to wine country. And there was about, if I remember correctly, 10 to 12 of us, maybe for about three or four spots. And what happens is, which you had no idea, they're interviewing you all the time, but you don't know. You're thinking, oh, this is great. Flying to the wine country. I'm going to, we're doing these barrel dinners, like this extravagant dinner, six glasses of wine in front of you. And Fortunately, we had good training here at LMU. I could handle my, my alcohol. Uh, but a lot of people couldn't, right? They thought it was party time. The next morning was the interviews. And, and we had some people who didn't show up. And oddly enough, true story, I was up till two with the executives uh, having drinks at the bar. I don't recommend it, but I was there in the morning. We had a great time. And next thing you know, I made one of those uh, management development slots uh, with the EJ Gallo Winery. And really everything... I, I've done, I really owe, not only to LMU for introducing me to that company, but that training, uh, that management training, uh, development management of people. It's so difficult, but it's so important in business. So we're going to talk a lot about books. Um, you know, I think one big piece of advice, and by the way, I'm here, I, I didn't mention it, I'm here to talk, as you know, asset and property management, but I'm really here to talk to you about how to get what you want and business. And that's where the Tony Robbins stuff comes into play, because that changed my life. So when I look back on, on my career, and I'm turning 45 next month, that's old. The time flies. Yes. I remember being here, it seems like yesterday, unfortunately. Um, when I look back on my career, there was a huge pivot when I went and, and learned Tony Robbins. Huge pivot. So I thought to myself, how can I get back? If you take nothing else, we'll point out some books. Look into Tony Robbins if you want. If not, I mean, he's got books himself that you can look into. But you're going to hear a lot today about mindset, which, very cool, and I'll lead with it so you don't think I'm just here to waste your time. There's a new one I'm working on, a book called Mindset. I bought everyone a copy. Unfortunately, Amazon needed the day late of delivery. So it's actually being delivered in my house today. I got the email. It was supposed to be there yesterday. So here's your first assignment. If you want a copy of Mindset, I bought 20. Covers us. I don't know how many on Zoom, but the first 20 uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're comfortable with it, just give me your address and I'll, I'll send it to you. I don't need 20 copies. And I really wanted to give that to you guys as a gift. Um, so if you're if you're cool with it, just the mailing address, whatever it is, say LMU certificate program, and I'll be happy uh, to send you a copy of the book. And I'll try to write a nice little note in there uh, for you as well as a reminder. So that's my uh, LMU story uh, and into Ian J. Gallo Winery. Um, after five years. I left the winery. I was managing the state of Nevada, so, so three distributorships uh, with them. And after five years, I said, you know, I'm young. Some of my friends left and went into medical device sales, uh, all money driven. You know, I don't make decisions based on money, but when you're young, you were just, it was, you know, I wanted to make more money. So that's what I did for another five years um, as a sales rep, selling uh, aesthetic lasers to dermatologists and plastic surgeons uh, like hair removal you know, type uh, and skin resurfacing stuff. So I did that for five years. So you could tell I get the five-year itch. And then after that, I went and joined Moss Company, right where I am currently today. Um, I went into Moss Company for business development because that was my background, sales. 
when I joined Moss and Company in 2011, we had just under 4,000 units. Uh, and when I say units, I mean doors, multi-family apartments, so the buildings, home units or doors in the industry. Uh, we also have a commercial division um, of about uh, 2 million people. But when I joined, remember all that E&J Gallo management team. And this is another great thing to take away. Whatever company you go and work for and start your own, if you work for someone else, if you add value, create value for the company, you will pave your way. Right? It's hard to do. There's a lot of people that will be hired to do the job requirement, but there's very few people that will do the job requirement and add value on top of it. And as long as you're adding value, you're, you're priceless to the organization. And they'll do what, whatever it takes to keep you. So with that in mind, at Moss, again, sales background, I didn't really know much about real estate. I wore a suit every day uh, in the medical device uh, world. And when I got to property management, what do you guys think of when you hear property management? Come on, let's hear it. Most people say the old man or woman in a row Right, coming out like right. you know, out of the apartment that helps them yeah. to collect rent. Does everyone think of property management like that or not? Is that old school? A little bit in the back, cool. Yes. Yeah, the pick and the pickup truck. Pickup truck. Yeah. Back, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it probably wasn't too far back then. Now it's come along where rents are today and level of services. We'll talk about that. Uh, it's definitely much more professional. Professional since a lot more money came uh, to the industry in the last really 10 years, right? When, 12 years, when you think of it uh, from a business standpoint, from an investment opportunity standpoint, a lot of capital came pouring in, a lot of new startups came uh, in the in the works in the industry. And with that came a level of service, level of return, et cetera, et cetera. But um, when I started, I was going to the city as my company. So I would go on sales calls uh, with to property owners and they're like shocked. What is this guy in a suit? You know, well educated. I'm not putting the industry down. It was just a different industry uh, back then. So it was a, it was an easy set, I guess is my point. And uh, from there, from 2011 uh, till now, we have about 15,000 doors. Um, with that growth, talk about added value. I went from business development to organically from that DJ Gallo training. Organically, people started coming to me from a management standpoint. Organic. I didn't have a title. They just started coming to me. Why? Because I listened and I care. That's it. If you listen and you truly care, people are going to love to work for you. So organically, that happened. The company saw that um, you know Chris is kind of developing a lot of followers, what have you. They're, they're kind of a, a, it's attractive, but you get the point. Like working with me versus maybe their current uh, supervisors at the time. Bottom line went to uh, the executive VP and now president. Um, but um, my point with that is if I could do it anyway. And so it's just about adding value. Let me see if I missed anything here. Oh, uh, in the process, uh, my career with Moss over the last, what, 14, 15 years now, um, also being in the industry. Anyone interested in investing in real estate? I great uh, passive uh, opportunity for passive income. So the nice thing about being in the industry, once you know it, boy, you could really kind of tell what deals are out there, especially from an operating standpoint. We'll talk about that today as well. So over the years, I uh, went in, started investing with clients, which was really cool. Uh, bought a couple of buildings of my own. And um, most recently, if you could believe it or not, the last two were office buildings, right? And everyone's going, what the hell are you doing? Well, it's a good story. It's in Westlake Village. Uh, they're full. I'll tell you more about those as well. Um, but yeah, a little risky. One, I'll, I'll give you more details on those if you guys want to hear about it, because I know investment uh, becomes very popular. So that's a little bit about me. I think the last thing I want to mention, and, and uh, Mr. Felton here is the same way. He's also an LMU grad from, from O1. We both played, we get the, have the privilege, of, privilege of working with him now. We were both here at LMU playing baseball. And they're putting our... 22,000 team in the Hall of Fame no. next week, right? Well, next week, isn't that cool? Any baseball players in the house? Oh, I think actually, I pitched. He pitched too. Yeah. Um, where are these baseball players? Every time I come to this class, there's no damn baseball. You know, they're just like me, walking around. You know, not knowing what to do. 
or maybe thinking of going to MLB, you know. Uh, any questions on on my past of what I shared? Don't be shy. Easy group. All right. Any questions on how to get a book, a copy of the book, Mindset? It's not my most recommended book. It's one I'm reading now, and I really enjoy it. Um, and I just try to get my hands on so much of this uh, mindset, emotional state. We'll talk about that um, that's the game changer at the end of the day. Uh, I, I don't want to get to the good stuff. I want to save that uh, for later. Let's see if this is working again. Did it turn off? You think? Uh, it might be because I put the zoom back. Oh, you know what? Now you need So I can. Is that it? I can just hit the button. That easier. Actually, I think we're fixed. Yeah, try now. My fault. Yeah, there we go. All right. We already talked about a little bit of the difference of asset management, property management. I believe there are three questions at the end of this thing. I checked them the same as last time, so I have no idea what they are. Uh, but I'm, I'll try to highlight to make it easier for you. I'm pretty sure the asset management and property management, the difference is. So number one is really kind of managing numbers. So if you're a numbers person, do the asset management side. If you're a people person, get on the property management side. Either way, nobody, if I am, well, I'll just ask a question. I won't assume. How many people want to get into property management when they graduate? Yes. Yes, I love you. Uh, because no one ever wants to get into property management. <laughs> you know, it's something you just fall into usually. But that's fantastic. You're hard. Okay. You already know what you want to do. You got a job when you're ready. Um, yeah, property management, generally speaking, right? Typically, and I love that. It's the first time. Uh, but in all other classes, nobody, nobody is like, that's the direction I'm going. Uh, but it, it happens. I, every story, everyone in the industry, I fell into. And there's some story of falling into the industry uh, of property management. But before I kind of dive in further, the good news about property management is you have, it really covers everything in business. I mean, whatever you want to do in business, they're, they're in property management, you can do it. I listed a couple of them up there, so areas of interest. So certainly from a customer service standpoint, if you're a people person, you're hired. They're, they're hard to find You know, for uh, our on-site teams. Um, we're hiring all the time. Uh, if you're an accountant, accounting is your thing. We got a whole accounting department in, in the industry. Uh, operations, big thing, finance, you know, asset management. We talked about managing the numbers, uh, senior accountants, accounting managers, uh, CFOs, et cetera, in the finance accounting world. Um, construction management, you like construction, building things, managing maintenance teams. That's what this guy's going to talk to you about uh, later. He's our VP of our service team, which in includes construction and maintenance. Um, business development, you like sales. That's in property management. And then of course, usually everyone's favorite is investment, right? So hopefully if you're here today, one of those things excites you in some way, at some way. So by show of hands, how many people here are mainly invested and want to learn about real estate because of investment? Usually the number one uh, that's most intense. Okay, I'll just go through it quickly. Uh, well, I, I won't go through it all. If you didn't raise your hand for investment, is there something else that's uh, more applicable or more higher interest? I mean, operations. Operations. Yeah, you're the operations guy. Cool. Same? Kind of. Who else? Operations or customer service. Nice. Nice. I love it. Hard to find. See, everyone wants to make money. So that's uh, but that's great. Both of you guys. And probably, well, you're expensive. <laughs> <laughs> MBA. <laughs> um, any other topics or, or reasons why you're here, you're interested, that uh, is not covered on the board? Sounds like mostly investment, customer service, operation. Anything else? I'm glad I'm not said it. I'm not <laughs> But it's there if you want, you know. Uh, okay, let's dive in. Anyone bored yet? Yes. We will take breaks. I'll play some music. That's a Tony Robbins thing, right? At any time you want to get up and stretch, go for it. Uh, keep yourself in it mentally. All right.
So we look, we just talked about why you're here, what do you hope to achieve? But what else other than learning about some of the things you just mentioned? What else are you hoping to learn today? Specifically? I'm here to upgrade my mindset. Every time I come to your speech, I always get something new. So I love to consider. And now you got to learn. So soon. Soon. Anyone else? Mindset. I know that everyone's probably saying, what the what's your state? It's the most important thing that you could ever learn. The game changer of life. You already know that? What? Oh, um, no. I was going to do my thing. Do your question. Sure. No, go ahead. Well, well, for me, I was just going to say, I'm just here. For them. I mean, just I'm trying to learn all the different angles of the real estate business. Okay. You know, to find out, to find, figure out what I want to get into. Yeah. 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 Within real estate. Probably. Yeah. You talked about adding value. Property management feels like a very strong skill. Added value to your day to day. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to talk about that, different types of investments and why real estate for some others, and it all comes down to control. With what you just said, I value as an operator. Yeah. Well, my goal next to be financial freedom. Woo! Financial freedom. Are you? I think just pull up Tony Robbins right now. Is that no, what you're no, no, no. <laughs> That's my thing. Like, stability is cool, but I want to. Hell yeah! Are you financial I'm freedom. Figure out what part of this I want to get to. Nice. I think the word about what's just the real estate. I was asking what the goal is. I feel it's a lot of set. Oh, well. so that's why I can sit here and talk to you guys about. Knowledge, and I'll get to that slide. But it's, knowledge is potential power. It's not. It's potential. I shouldn't say it's not. It's execution, right? And you only execute in the right mindset. It's action. Action is is power, right? And so I'm totally giving away my slides, but that's awesome. Financial freedom. So I don't want to know if you know, but make sure you put the number up. I don't want don't say right. But what does that mean? You know what I mean? Uh, and that's part of the mindset, and it's talk, part of writing goals. Now you get, now you get me excited, and we will be writing goals or typing. I write in these days, uh, or writing whatever you want to do. But we will be doing a little goal setting uh, exercise today. How many of you write down your goals annually? Surprise! It's Friday afternoon. You guys are good. Uh, for those that didn't raise your hand, very important. Make sure you do it. That's another assignment. Uh, we're going to do it today, and if you've already done it, nothing wrong with doing it again, because you'll come up with something else, especially the way uh, we might do it a little differently, depending on how on how you do it. What else do we hope to achieve? Did we cover everything? No, someone said, I hope to achieve to get out here. Anyone else? No. All right. I think we're going to Gulp right after this for, for dinner. So whoever wants a free dinner could meet us at Gulp. <laughs> All right, why am I here today? Okay, we're starting to go with Tony Robbins style. He defines uh, six human needs here. Um, and I believe you guys have these uh, slides, right? Or they've been sent out, so you don't need to uh, write them all down. Everybody is dominant by, we all have these needs, by the way. But there's going to be one or two that are more dominant than, than others. So the reason I bring this up is when I first got out of school, I wanted uncertainty or variety and significance. Just a young man, I'm, it's, I think it's kind of normal in our society, right? You want to be different and you want variety, whatever that means. And uncertainty, variety is like risk, right? The unknown, right? Kind of when you're younger, that's typically normal. Hopefully, as you mature and as I'll say, you know, get smarter. As I got older, now the two that dominate are growth and contribution. And that's a great thing to do as a human being rather than significant. But growth and contribution. So that's how Tony defines it. And as you can see in contribution is just a sense of service and focus on helping, giving and supporting others. That's why I'm here for contribution to you guys. Don Miller, another good book, author, write it down, uh, describes uh, every story. So he has uh, down at the bottom, Hero on a Mission is his book. Um, and he describes every story, as you see here, as a victim, villain, hero, guide. And the cool lesson that, that Don teaches 
is no matter where you are in life, you're the author of your story. And you can change the story at any time. Now, being a baseball guy, uh, and I actually next month I'm opening a new baseball facility with some MLB guys. I, I bring that up because these MLB guys, you guys know uh, Jared and Jeff Weaver? Pitchers? No, we're older. Uh, Royce Clayton, I think he's even older. Royce, uh, short side. These are like 14 years in the big leagues, guys. Uh, anyway, talk about Don and uh, rewriting your story. Think about that for a second. Forget about them, you guys don't know. How about uh, an Olympian? They win the gold. Tony talks about this all the time. They're on top of the world. They reach the peak of their career. Two weeks later, they win. Not all. So, why? Is it their story? Right? Now, it's up to them to rewrite the story. Come up with a new thing in life. And you do that throughout the different stages of life. And you're going to be happy. You're the author. You get to do whatever you want. But you got to rewrite the story. Otherwise, you might find yourself depressed, right, into who knows what. Because my purpose, I had all this purpose, all this attention, I reached a pinnacle. And now, now what's next? Right? How do you top that in, this, in essence? Well, you top it by rewriting your story. So that's a great book. Um, and, and certainly you could help friends and, and family with, uh, you know, as, as you get older, you rewrite it. So... Bottom line, I think the point on Don Miller is again, as you kind of go through a career and you get older at first, what did I want to be? Which one do you think? I wanted to be the hero, right? What do I want to be now? I'm too old to be the hero. I want to be the guy, the one that helps the hero succeed. You guys are the heroes now. I just want to be the guide. And that's another reason why I'm here. You could see a trend. Ray Dalio, Three Stages of Life. You see him there, I won't read him. But stage three, as you get later in life, you wanna see other people you care about succeed. So this whole certificate program, I know the other speakers and I know that's why they're here. It's not because we get half a million dollars in just for this one time. It's no, no impersonal. Now, we don't get paid. This is uh, volunteer. Volunteer, 100%. Um, but we're, I'm truly here to be a guy. Now, when I walk out of here today and you walk out of here today, you have an option. This young man is not better than I've seen. You could take my business card and let me help you someday if you need it. Or you can walk out and say, look, next. Now, I'm not that important, right? I would just say, connect, though, just a minute. Right, that would be my way. And use these, not only the certificate program, but other people, alumni that you meet, put them in your, what I would call the Rolodex, what you guys would call the contact list in the phone, right? But utilize us. That's why we're here. We are here to help. And this young man came and said, I want to do an internship, and he, he rocked it. And now I get to see him on LinkedIn with all these crazy posts and you know, pretty soon I'll be working for them. <laughs> so you never know, right? You got to help people. So when they're there, they might be hiring you someday. Um, any questions as to why I'm here today? That's important. Anyone think I'm bullshit? Sure? The Don Miller Wood Post, two ninety nine for the Kindle version. Amazon. It's just a cool way of looking at life. Um, it's it's so simplistic about you're the author, you get to write the story. The problem in this, right, as he talks about, a lot of us never write the story. We go through life with no goal, no direction, and just kind of wherever I end up, I end up. It's not bad, but if you're the author of your story, isn't it a lot cooler to say, I'm going this way, and then figure out how to get there. And once you have that direction, it's a game changer, direction and mindset, which we'll talk about. Uh, anyway, that's why I'm here today. So thank you for being here on a Friday. Time is the most valuable, um, you know, gift uh, to give. And I thank you for uh, giving me your time today. And I will get you out a little. Uh, 
uh, as my promise, as my my give back to you. All right, so I went over this. I believe this is one of those questions at the end of the uh, class. So knowledge is not power, right? Everyone says knowledge is crap, potential power. You got to do something. Uh, at the end of the day, I think on the thing, action or execution. So today you'll get some knowledge, but now you have the best knowledge over anyone in this school that knowledge is potential, action is power. If you leave this class with nothing else but that, go out and take massive action, make all kinds of mistakes, because you're gonna learn, and you will be that much further ahead of anyone else. Make sense on action? Action being most powerful? Okay. Very simple. Any action, by the way. Okay, asset classes. So these are from an investment standpoint, just some of the other alternatives uh, for investment, right? So a lot of hands went up for investment in real estate, um, stocks, bonds, fixed income, other alternatives like crypto. Uh, anyone like to trade fine art? No. Oh, yeah, good job. Very I can't hear you. Oh, very cool. I, I always say that. That's first today's a first for a lot today. So I'm I'm glad you're here. Um crypto. Everyone love crypto? I know all you guys love crypto. I'm not. I'm, I'm too old for crypto. But I think the important thing, real estate is just another asset class, right? To put your money in as a vehicle of investment. So why real estate? We talked about it earlier. I could put my money into the stock and put it. How much control do I have over the stock? Assuming I'm not working, right? Yeah, unless unless you're like uh, taking over on a board or something, right? You're on the majority of shit. No, if I'm putting a thousand dollars into a stock, it's uh, there's zero control. Fixed income, you don't need a whole lot of control. Crypto, how much how much control do you have over crypto? Not right. So those are just things, as I say, throw it, throw it in the pot and, and hold your breath, right? Good luck type thing. Whereas real estate, you have some control. And that's why I love it as, as a vehicle of investment. So this actually came from uh, one of the other, who, who teaches? I'm, I'm going to Anthony, Anthony. Anthony Walker. Everyone saw Anthony last semester? So this is one of his slides. So I took it right from him. Direct control over asset or investment, that's one of the advantages. But what I thought was interesting was a disadvantage. Management burden and complexity. As an experienced operator, you don't have, you got that complexity. That's just knowledge, you're not potential power, right? Management burden, that's our job. That's what we love to do. So as a property manager, you've already got those two disadvantages covered and you have the control of real estate. So if you could imagine from property management, although on the surface doesn't sound very cool, but now when you look at it like this, you could look under the hood of any property to see how it's being operated to determine if there's upside for your investment, period. If you know operation, hell, you don't even have to know operation. All you need to do is email me and I'll tell you if you're looking at a deal and if there's upside, so if you don't know it, make sure you have somebody in your network that knows it that can help you. But the single biggest thing you can do, which I've done in the past, invest in properties with the great steps. How do you do? Pick a location, sure. Pick an asset type, sure. Is it newer? Is it older? Is it rent control? Is it not rent control? Is it in good shape, bad shape, right? Deferred maintenance, not deferred maintenance, blah, blah, blah. None of that, none of that matters. What matters is how is it being operated? How efficient is it? And what efficiencies do you bring as the operator to increase NOI or the value of capital? Yes, sir. Um, lack of liquidity for an expanded for the CIO to go up or down. Let's say you take one action and take an asset to like pretty much. It's like, what's the shy? Pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, right? Because that's temporary money you're just kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Okay. So at some point, Unfortunately, yeah, if you need that cash, we're, you're going to pay taxes eventually, right? right? In this position. Yes, sir. What are you going to do? You cash out. 
Cash out refi, there you go. If you got a lot of equity, cash out refi, tax free for the year. Right. So that would be another thing. Just sell the property. Yeah, yeah, it's that you're covering it. Yeah. But cash out, you, you see that all the time. By the way, a lot of our clients, 15,000 units, a lot, you know, our largest clients have, you know, a thousand to 1,500 units. So significant uh, portfolios in LA. And that's their, that's their strategy. They'll buy, 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 right? They have them forever. And then with interest rates, depending on the cycle, what have you, cash out refi here, cash out refi there, and they're just getting dumped money year after year that they have too much to spend. That's kind of nice, right? That's why we're here. But yeah, cash out refi would be uh, a great way to get money out tax free. What did you have, sir? I was actually going to say cash out refi. You guys are good. But for the people that don't fully totally understand is when you collateralize your building and then borrow against it, you make up. Make sense? Means your building's worth, I'm going to take it down. But your building's worth two million. You owe one million, but you're going to take out 200,000 extra. So now you owe 1.2 and you just got about 200,000 extra. You're just going to pay something back. So. All right. Any other questions or comments? Good class so far. I'm impressed. How are we doing on time? Are we done yet? What time is it? Oh, really? 36? Yeah, okay. So I figure break in 15. You guys good with that? A little bathroom break? Okay, so that's why I have this slide up here. Point is, real estate as an asset, as a vehicle for investment, you have the most control over other, over other alternatives. That's my point. And his disadvantages are not disadvantages to us property managers. Okay, so overall goal, whether you're the asset manager or the property manager or a combination of the two is to maximize value. So we're gonna go into value right now, which is, which is kind of cool. And you guys have heard this before in the other certificate classes, uh, but one part of the valuation is a cap rate. Do you guys remember going over cap rates? It's okay to say no, everyone knows what cap rate is. I don't wanna waste your time. Oh, okay, cap rate. Basically, Here's the definition up here. So basically, it's if I buy this asset, you can throw away the debt first. So if I buy this asset at such and such price, the cap rate is the projected return I'm going to get on my investment. Right? So before interest rates, so cap rates are going to follow interest rates for the most part, although it's a lag. And what I mean by that is when interest rates were really low, call it. 3% to, so that's basically you're able to borrow money at 3%. Cap rates in LA, some of the things with huge cities, especially, you could have a cap rate uh, at 3.5, under 4%, which means people are willing to pay you more money because they're, they're willing to accept a 3.5% return, return on that investment, right? So that's what it was. As interest rates have gone up, that cap rate goes up, right? Because who in their right mind wants to borrow money at six and a half percent to make three and a half percent, right? So it's kind of a factor of, of interest rates at the end of the day. Cap rates do vary. I think it's on the next slide. Oh, by the way, I'll show you the, uh, this might be on the end of the deal too. Here's your property uh, value equation. NOI, net operating and income divided by your market cap rate. So that's where the cap rate comes into play on your valuation. I know that's a whole bunch of you know, BS, but uh, when you break it down, it's, it's pretty simple. And we will be breaking these other, the NOI down as well. But just remember cap rate. Cap rate, oh, I got to cut this slide on. So I don't know. Really, I was going to say is an external influence. Cap rate, you have no control over. If you buy in Manhattan Beach, Manhattan Beach is going to have a low cap rate. If you buy in San Bernardino, you're going to have a higher cap rate. These were old cap rates. I didn't update them. But just to give you an idea, look back in the day, two and a half percent in Mosa Beach. So when you take an NOI and you divide it by that cap rate, right? That lower the cap rate, that valuation flies. So a two and a half percent cap rate is insane. Uh, that just means uh, Mosa Beach is expensive. Look at that, Mosa Beach. I saw the high five. Uh, any questions on cap rate? Do you have any control over cap rate? Yes or no? No. 
the market dictates the cap rate. And it's usually dependent upon interest rate. Higher the interest rates, higher cost of borrowing, typically the higher requirement for return of the capital. Make sense? Okay, so that's the external influence. We said cap rate is part of the equation of value. Now we're going to go to NOI. Net operating income. Here's your formula. Take your income of the property, minus your expenses, gives you that out. Pretty cool. Pretty easy. So your equation, take your net operating income for the year, divided by the cap rate, that gives you your valuation of the property. Just like the formula was on the on the book. Now you can tell here it's this is an internal influence, meaning you have control of NOI. How do you have control of NOI? What is NOI? Income is this and this. How do you, do you have control over expenses? Hell well, yeah. That comes back to the efficiency of operation. So you can look at a deal and say, give me the financials on this property. It's being sold for 4.5 million. You look at the deal and you go, and you throw out some terms, throw out questions. Expense income ratio on that deal on paper is 52%. You go, oh, I could operate it better than that. And their evaluation of 4.5 million is based on that higher expenses, a higher income uh, expense income ratio. You could then say, wait, I could operate that at 42%, 10 points less, do a calculation and say, wow, that building's actually worth 5,000. So I'm going to go ahead and that. And that's all you did was look under the hood of how they own it. Don't ever take the brokers with all the brokers. They'll tell you what the NOI is and, and the value. No, you go and look for yourself and send it to a, uh, send it to me. Or once you guys are pros at this, then you'll be able to do it yourself. Um, do you have control over income? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I guess it was. LA makes it hard, right? With some of the rent control laws, which, you know, we can talk about that probably in the discussion. I think that's a hot thing, especially at the um, So you, you might have limited control, but let's remove rent control for a second, which just rent control, for those that don't know, it's the different jurisdictions or cities that put a maximum rent charge that you could do per year, uh, which during COVID, the last four years, you can do in LAC starting February next month. It's the first increase in four years. So yeah, the city, ordinance, right? They could screw with your income a little bit. Um, but from a, uh, let's say, rent control out of the question. So this is non-rent control. Now, do you have more control of income? What are some of the ways you have control of income? What you rent it for? Increase rent. Increase rent. How do you increase rent? Let's say you're in Mosa, you got to get 4,000 for one bedroom. How do you get 4,200, 4,500? Improve the property. Good. You can improve the, the actual property itself, renovations, upgrades. You could also just increase your services uh, from an operation standpoint, right? Throw some valet parking up front. And now you got a you know a self-parking uh, valet building, right? Now you could charge six thousand or whatever it is. So yes, you can manipulate your income. You could also go lower, right? We take overs for some clients that go. Chris, we want you guys to cut expenses. We want all the cash flow out of this thing as possible. And they cut, 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 cut. Next thing you know, people are moving out. The rents are dropping, right? Because the building's dirty, et cetera. So there's always a fine line of where you want to be. And the market will dictate that. The neighborhood, your comps, competitive stuff, when I say comps, uh, will determine kind of what the market rate is and what you can and can do to save money without affecting it or increase services which typically will increase your expenses to increase income. But bottom line, this is where you become the expert in transactions, is knowing, being a pro at income and expenses uh, from an operation standpoint, looking at the cap rates and understanding, are you buying something under market or not, right? So the best strategy right now, seven years ago, was buy an old building, kick everyone out, upgrade it, re-rent it, Fortunately, there are rules against it. No, no fault evictions. You may read about those, those uh, 
particles in the paper. So unfortunately, you can't do that. Anymore. But now that used to be the, the big strategy, right? Try to find something that hasn't been taken care of, the rents are low. We're going to go in, improve the building, and, and hike up the rents. That used to be it. Now, the best way to find the best deal is looking for the worst operator. That's it. That's the secret to real estate. Look for the worst operator. And I shouldn't say worst. An operator that has different roles. Right? That could be, as an example, and I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but let's say you hear the term mom and pop owners. So that might just be, let's just say an older couple, for an example, has a building, a fourplex, a twoplex, whatever it is, eight units, it doesn't matter. They hate vacancies. They hate showing the units, right? It's a waste of their time. They don't understand marketing. They just want a referral from the neighbor to get someone in paying $1,500 when the unit is actually worth $2,000. So that's the type of operational um, opportunity that exists out there. So if you want to invest now, just find a bad operator. You can usually look at the bill and see who the, who the bad operators are, uh, generally speaking. But that's a, a little secret. And um, we will get into expense and income ratios and all that stuff so you understand um, what you're looking for, what you're looking at when you look under the hood of an investment property. Um, so back to our goals, maximize revenue as a property manager or asset manager, your goal is the same, maximize revenue. We talked about increasing services, incre uh, improving the building. Bottom line, we need to increase income for rents. What are some other ways we can increase income? Laundry, storage, parking, and all those are ways to increase revenue. So you could get creative. You could have a uh, concession stand, you know, whatever, vending machines, things of that nature. And then at the same side, flip side, you want to minimize expenses because the more you maximize that NOI, the more you're maximizing what? Cash flow and NOI and value. Yeah. Uh, here's another book. Creating rating fans. I think it's just called rating fans. Our goal is to create rating fans. Um, great book. We talk about rating fans throughout our organization. That's one of our goals day to day, all processes. We want rating fan clients, property owners. We want rating fan tenants in our commercial buildings, and we want rating fan residents. Not always, but that's our goal. But it's a great book, easy read. Um, and they talk about, you know, raving fans, how you have a customer for life. If they're not a raving fan, they'll leave you when they get the next best, best option. So consider that too. And if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, you want a raving fan there, or they'll leave you too. No one's laughing at my jokes. Today. <laughs> that was too real. <laughs> that was too real. There were some breakups last night. Sorry. Um, okay. Different asset classes within real estate. We got residential and commercial. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Multi-family apartments. That's just another name. You guys probably know that. Um, sometimes multi-family is on the commercial side. But, you know, it's also residential. People live there. So call it what you will. But those are some of the uh, different asset classes. So when you say, hey, I want to invest in real estate, they're going to say, what asset class? What asset you know, type are you interested in? And that's office, industrial, whatever it is. I think you have a question. And your short-term vacation. Oh, did you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, what do you mean by multi-family? Is that just multi, <laughs> multiple businesses? In one All place? I was suggesting is sometimes apartments on multi-family, you will see under the commercial number. Okay. So it just depends who you're talking about. I put it under residential because people live in Yeah. In this yeah, absolutely. Mixed use. Good job. Mixed use. Everyone know what mixed use is? Usually, could be a variety of things, but usually retail at the bottom, apartments on the top. So different asset types within the same property. Very popular, obviously. Um, a lot of mixed use properties out there in LA. Um, a lot of new development 
uh, with mixed use. So very cool. Uh, what do you think, speaking of mixed use, what do you think are some advantages of mixed use? Say apartments above retail versus a regular apartment by itself. Income, more income, heck yeah, what else? A little less risk, like for example, in New York, you had some office buildings that would not pull up the detail on the bottom, you still be able to cash. Yeah, spreading across asset types, a little uh, diverse. Yeah, good, less risk, diversifying. What else? Think service. We talked about increasing service, you can increase rent. Maybe you have a restaurant downstairs that will bring food up to the restaurants or to the residents. Uh, similarly, maybe you have a dry cleaner downstairs that will kind of do door to door service, right? You could uh, increase their business uh, with the services of the building. So, yeah, mixed use. Um, is a is a great new trend and we've done a lot of lease ups lease up just means brand new construction you got to lease it up right it's going from nothing to something and we find when you have a mixed use building usually the retail is the last to be built out and moved in so people are moving in once you get that retail segment in there those those services in place boy it, more people want to live there, right so we kind of i don't want to say struggle it depends but it's harder to fill the building without those services than filling the building with the services uh, is the point there. So this is just uh, normal stuff, just different asset classes that I wanted to bring up. All right. So here we talked about the different revenue streams. Utility bill back. This is interesting. Everyone know what utility bill back is? Okay. So basically, most, every property is different, how utilities are set up. Generally speaking, they're, each unit in apartments are uh, metered for electric, separate, so everyone's paying their own electric bill. But usually they're not. Newer buildings are, I'm talking older buildings, are on the same meter for water. They're not individually metered. So in the past, the landlord would pay all of them. But now billing out, right, the law says you could take a pro rata share, you could take that $1,000 water bill per month and spread it across your whatever number of units or as a pro rata share. So it's utility billing. It's very common for any of those in apartments. Now you might see your monthly statement with your utilities as a separate line item. Uh, if it's an older building storage, laundry, we talked about TV and internet is interesting bulk now. So a lot of these landlords, I mentioned a lot of investment came into this industry. So a lot of institutional money, right? Well, institutional money, they need business and they want their money back. They want their returns. So they took, right, so all these different revenue streams really came from the popularity of the investment uh, of, of the industry, really. Um, so TV and internet basically means a landlord is paying, the, let's say DirecTV, is paying DirecTV for TV and internet for every unit. And because it's a bulk deal, call it 100 units, 50 units, whatever the building is, they're getting a discounted price. So maybe it's costing the landlord 35 bucks per door or per unit. The landlord will turn around and charge 50 bucks, right, uh, for the TV. So it's already there for you. And then there's a little upcharge. So that's just another example of revenue stream. We talked about vending, common area rentals. If there's a big kitchen, game room, or something you want to throw a party, you could pay for it. EV charging stations now. Uh, EV, uh, you know, uh, car charging stations are all over the place. So there's an upcharge usually uh, for those stations to be used on, on uh, site. Then you also have pet rent. You got a pet. Everyone loves their pet. You're going to pay for the pet rent. That's another big thing. So none of this existed. I don't want to exaggerate time flies. Certainly 10 years ago. It would be weird if you're paying, if you're charging someone for their pet. I'm guessing maybe, maybe longer, 10, 12 years ago. But you just see how the industry has changed. Uh, and I don't want to say nickel and diamond, but trying to maximize rent. We'll say that. Uh, here are some ways to minimize expenses. We talked about cutting services. So maybe you have a, a janitorial company that comes four days a week to clean all the common areas and walkways. You could always cut that down, you know, two days a week. I don't recommend it, but that's one way to minimize expenses. Uh, economies of scale. So this is where an advantage, this is where when we sell our company, Moscow Company, one of the advantages of being a regional company and having 15,000 doors in LA is to tell an owner, Look, we have leverage. We're going to save you money. Any service you could get with anyone else, we're going to get the same service at less cost, right? So economies of scale. Sometimes you could utilize your operator, your property manager for that, unless you're, you know, doing it yourself. Um, 
implementing a bidding process, not going with the first bid and spending, right? Really trying to get the lowest price uh, and creating efficiencies of properties, uh, things of that nature. Um, bottom line, it takes time and effort to run a building well and also uh, decrease expenses. And when you think you got it, start all over, right? All the processes. Uh, but those are some ways to increase value, right? We're increasing income, decreasing expenses, increasing the NOI, which is uh, which is a, in the formula for value. That's why we're doing it. I'll tell you what, this might be a good time because I'm going to switch screens. I've got a P&L example. So we've talked about looking at properties, looking under the hood at the financials. I'm going to pull up a financial so you get to see what we do every day. Uh, this is not in the presentation you have. If you want it, you could email me through LinkedIn. I could send it to you. Of course, I'm going to block out the, the address uh, because this is a real uh, theme now. Uh, it's fit for you so that we'll dive into. But I'll pretty appreciate it. The, you know, it's basically it's just a spreadsheet. So I won't spend too much time with you. So. But why don't we take a 10 minute break? Uh, restroom, phone calls, text messages. Uh, what else? Drinks, snacks. Thank you guys. Great group so far. And I'm going to play some MJ because I just saw the play. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's what I said. All right, what's it he has a YouTube like podcast channel, and he can show reference on like even when I put his brand on the course past the week, which is so I have a little bit of conversation. I am actually all right now. Yeah, I don't have to do the right. I was just a bug. No problem. Yeah, I didn't get you. I already saw you in that. I got you. Yeah, cool. I also have my. Oh, my card is like the mini notepad. I'm just
For another hour and a half. Nice meeting, man. What's up? We have a lot of time there, so I have to give it a lot of time that we, that we utilize. Okay. So, I could also see if that's in the morning. Yeah. I need to make sure that some of the more exciting things.
What's up, this year? What's your name? Then go, well. Yeah. So, I did. Yeah. 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 Oh, I see. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I see where you're going. The answer is zero. No, it's uh, some of my closest friends, closest experience and you know, all the uh, I don't know how the water flow is if you have that idea. If you have that, if you don't have it, it might be different. You know. So I would say if you're asking and you're thinking it's probably probably the water. What day are you coming off? And were you here last year also? Or was it that was uh, and where are you from? Are you like, oh, yeah. So what do you think it would be done after they go to but I'll, I'll tell you this. I would not, I would make the change if you want to. I wouldn't do it for an or quote unquote security of in all that. Kind of so, on that note, I would say go find it. Put all your attention on the sport and the school, and don't worry about the internship learning. Because the reality is so young, I was so And whenever you are done with that, whether it's next year, or it's two years, two years, whatever it is. Business was still because you might regret yeah. quit. Yeah. Or it's not because it is, you know, things that hold on. Especially if you're starting. But how's the team? Are, you, are they not really tight? I mean, if you're not yeah, here, so you're probably still coming from, you know, high school. Those guys are like, kicking around outside in, and they're out of the pool. Yeah, so it's a little tough. Yeah, it's not really the main thing. 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 Yeah, it's yeah, you got it. Good luck, man. Congrats on the conference. So, does that mean playoffs for right now, or, or I mean, is there is there some active conference? A little different. A little different. Uh, yeah. That's benches in the air. That front ass there for thousands of years. The grizzly bulls from every continent. You're like, like you said, it's like different. They got kids. Well, 
I'm also finding that I can't balance doing this and having uh like it's nice to get a break and clear my game and tools of those three out and then find Yeah, that's kinda how I look at baseball. I was never pro bound, but it kept me in school to get good grades, focus, the set of plans. Um, you know, I loved it. Open yeah. But it was that more gymnastics. Which is what kind of but maybe for the shoes of black. But either way, I wish you luck. It's great. I mean, well, keep to it until you really know you've done it because you might regret it. That's my hope. Good man. Um, you want me to talk to you after or right after? I know you probably. Uh, yeah, if yeah, if you don't mind, I'll be here after. Oh, okay. Is yeah. that cool? That I, we'll I we'll end early. Again. We'll end early. Okay, sounds good. But yeah, I look forward to it, and we'll have another break too. Excuse me. Oh, you did good. All right, one minute, one minute. It was fun. Enjoy numbers. I'm just going to turn it up and end all conversations. Anyone else enjoying MJ? Yeah. Everyone know MJ, right? No one's name is that. You never know. That's how old I am. Is everyone back? Hopefully. All right. The uh, promise P and L I told you about. Everyone, if you have a phone or whatever, count, get a calculator because this will be this will be fun. I'm just going to go over just a few things. Quick intro. I will put you to sleep if we still have to do this too long. And I think uh, Brian Thompson is ready to go and, and present to you too. Uh, in our industry, we're calling this a PL, right? Profit loss statement. You have all your different income uh, and expense categories over here, your accounting codes. And then you'll see I ran this for, for the end of uh, the year. Uh, which is December. So in this custom report, I ran it for December, just so last month, but it's going to give you a trail of the three months prior. So you're going to see all this is the same, but it's for each month, right? So September, October, November, December. Make sense so far? Four month picture. Then you're going to have a year to date. So because it's December, this is the end of year total numbers. And then you can have a year to date, how it compared to last year, right? Pretty important uh, from an operations standpoint. Prior month ad, average, one of our partners came up with this that he liked. And basically, for that category, we give a, an average per month just to kind of are we are we in line or, or is something out of whack? Um, your percentage difference um, for that category uh, year over year, and whatever that percentage in the dollar amount. And that's the, the variance between 2023 versus 2022. This, in particular, you'll see everything above total operating revenue. We talked about income. Here are all your different income codes. So we talked about utility income. There it is. Anything you collect would fall under that. 
RSO fees. These are city fees from the city of LA. Renters insurance, laundry room income, you get the idea. All the income that that property is producing for the client. Any questions on that? So when we're looking at income, one thing I always look at, no matter where we are in the period of the year, I'm looking at my year to date. I'm sorry, I moved it. Let me go back to income. I moved too much. Okay, here's your income. I always like to look at year to date. So this is for 2023 and how we did those last year. And I love looking at this. Right. So this is the rent control building, and we have 5% growth in income. Then you could just determine, okay, where did that 5% come from? Look at the top rental income. Total residential income 5%. So that was the driver of the growth, right? Was it was it utility? Was it laundry? Did, did someone move in with a bunch of pets? You know, where what's the reason for the income? So now I could call this client and say, hey, in a world of no rent increases, we still increase your rent 5%. Now, how did we increase rent 5%? What would be some of the factors? If, if you can't, in the city of LA, rent control, legally in 2023, we could not increase rents. So what do you guys think? Some creative thinking here. How could we get that number to increase five percent? Anybody? So you have other, yeah, you have other incomes that that will contribute to the bottom line. But I'm talking specifically at the top, so I'm a little short. No, that's okay. See the five percent up there under total residential income. So on everything up there is rental income only. But you're right. You could you could still increase by other sources of revenue. But how do you think income, what are some of the ways income might go up or down um, when you can't increase rents? Maxing up occupancy. Occupancy, huge, huge, year over year occupancy. So it would be interesting to see, did we have a, a better uh, average occupancy in 2023 versus 2022? Occupancy is huge. You wanna get fired as an operator? Slack on occupancy, biggest red flag in our business. So we talk about KPIs, key performance indicators. Occupancy is number one in our business. Good. Occupancy. What else? Occupancy is the big one. I'll give you the other one. Remember, it's, it's rent control. So you might have units that are under market. If they move out on their own, they went to another building for whatever reason or moved out of state, you could take that that uh, unit that was maybe being rented at you know eighteen hundred a month. Now you could take it up to twenty two hundred. So just overall unit terms in a rent control environment, just by taking it up to the market rate when someone moves out on their own, is another way to increase income. Generally speaking, as a landlord, if you're the property owner, do you want that low paying rent controlled unit to move out? That's what you're betting on when you're buying something like this. You're not trying to kick them out, but if they move out on their own, you're thrown apart, right? Because you just increase your NOI and valuation. I'll give you a real life example. I told you at the intro, I bought two buildings. They're eight unit buildings. One's by Paramount Studios in LA. Right now, we're in an eviction case. Rent control, protect the renter, right? This is what happens in the in the newspapers, in the media. When I bought it in 2015, I had a bunch of low paying rents. People paying $750 in a $2,000 unit, half the building. I still have those same tenants and I'm fine. Live there as long as you want. I'm, I'm totally cool with it. That's not my goal to kick them out. But one of my low paying residents, he, during COVID, he, he uh, didn't pay balance. So we went to knock, the manager went up to knock to say, hey, you, you owe this money. Someone else answered me and said, oh no, I paid him rent. He subleased. So this guy is, is now the landlord, probably making more money than me on the one unit, you know, subleasing the unit. So believe me, there are bad actors with landlords trying to kick low pays out uh, and it shouldn't happen. But Landlords also get, right? And this is an example. 
So when something like that happens, you give what's called a three day uh, cure or quit, basically cure the situation or you're done, three day notice. Of course, that person is still there. We knew, I mean, who knows how long he's been subleasing this done, but because in COVID, you're kind of hands off. And um, so we went to court and now we have a jury trial set up for February. Um, so we'll see, you know, who knows what he'll tell the judge and who knows what the judge will will do, but there's a good example, unfortunately, of a, a resident taking advantage of the rent control laws um, and not moving out, but just subleasing it. Does everyone know what happened there? He's subleasing it for, call it 1800, whatever it is, and he's paying seven. So he's making pretty good income uh, uh, on my time, unfortunately. So that's just an example. So that's the income side of things. I'm gonna scroll down. I mean, this thing is like six pages. I don't wanna bore you. Question. You pay him to leave. You can't pay him to leave. Um, and usually in eviction court, they never go to all the way to trial. Usually there's a settlement before court. And that's when you'll say, look, you owe this much, and I'll give you, you know, three grand for your moving expenses to, to leave. That happens all the time. It's called cash for keys. There's just an article out in the LA Times uh, because the controller of the city is starting to track all this stuff. And yeah, I was actually quoted in in the article. Um, the city controller puts it out to say, oh, there's 5,000 cash for keys offers, you know, these greedy landlords just kind of the premise of the argument. But the truth is, what happens with these, what are still considered cash for keys, is remember COVID, a lot of people ran up balances. So they were owing uh, our clients 30, 40, $50,000. Some needed that, but some are driving brand new BMWs. Right. So there's always extremes. I'm not saying one is always right versus the other. But what happens is in that scenario, like February 1 is a due date coming up for some of that COVID past debt is coming up February. So if someone has 30 grand, maybe they don't have it to pay. So then the landlord would say in February, okay, now we're going to go to eviction. Well, that resident the eviction process could be four to six months cost another 10 grand in legal fees. So instead of wasting the four to six months of unpaid rent, because you can't collect rent when you're in eviction and the legal fees, that's when the cash for fees come into play. So in that example, we actually have residents coming to us to say, hey, I owe 20 grand. I don't have the money to pay. I will move out, you know, in February if you forego what I owe. So that in the city of LA is considered cash for fees. And so we have to submit that paperwork. So here's the controller saying so reading landlord, but actually, you know, the tenant approaches in, in that case. So don't always believe, you know, what you hear. There's extremes on both sides and you can take any stat and make it, you know, make it true, right? That point of view. But there's a bad actor on side on the landlord side, as well as the tenant side. Uh, and I gave you an example of both. But yeah, you can't pay them. Uh, to to get them out. And in the, in California, it's more and more popular just because of our court system and legal system. It just takes too long and it's costly. Now you got me going. I'm going to give you one more point. LA, you ready for this? Okay. Remember, people will owe for COVID, COVID debt, right? If, if you claim COVID, all you have to do is say, I have you know, COVID, I'm not paying my so these balances were paid. The state of California had a COVID rent relief program. So anyone that claimed COVID, we would fill out the application through the state, the tenant or the resident would do their portion of the uh, application. And we got probably 80% of the rent of through when the state ended it in, uh, I think it was March, 2021. So the, the state said, okay, no more emergency ordinance. The rent relief is done. It ended together. Mm -hmm. So if you're the landlord and you're not getting paid, California had a way of getting you money. Okay, makes sense. Help people that need it. Don't put it on the backs of the landlord. Get the landlords mm -hmm. paid. We collected about 80%. It wasn't perfect, but it was at least a good idea. Go ahead. Did the state do rent relief for COVID rent relief on non-rent people? Yeah. Yeah, this was... This was any, it did not have to be rent control. Yeah, this was any unit, uh, multifamily, um, with really just qualification that the, the resident had to come up with, right? 
Um, so that's what happened with the state. Now the city decides to extend that emergency ordinance another 12 months, meaning, okay, the state ended it, but if you're within the city of LA, you don't have to pay. And we're going, okay, who's gonna pay? So in our industry, we're very close, right, to the city council. There's, we only have two city council opinions on, on the landlord side. It's not a good issue. So they're passing all kinds of tough things and stuff. Anyway, I contact city council, I had lunch with one of the guys who's no longer, he lost the, the control race. And I said, so where's the money? Are, are you guys gonna pay the landlords? Like you wanna you know, extend it 12 months, fine. Extend it all you want, but pay the landlords. You know what you did? No joke. Oh, we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> I'm like, you son of a, you know what? Right? I'm like, who's writing these policies? It just doesn't make sense. Here's what's here's the topic. This is why I was laughing when you kind of got me on the soapbox. Here's the worst part. So all of that doesn't make sense. Fine. Our clients in LA, because this was LA specific, we accrued over another $10 million that wasn't paid in that. Now, it's not lost because now it comes due, right? As we talked about, like in February. But what happens? Do you collect it? Sometimes people will pay because they're playing games, but others, no, you give them like, okay, leave and we'll forego that, right? So there's a lot of that. So a lot of that won't be. So this is what really gets City council is passing right to council for anyone facing eviction, meaning city funded attorney if you're facing eviction. So remember, you didn't have to pay the landlord. You owe the landlord X amount of money and they earmark $65 million to give to attorneys to represent people facing eviction. Take that 65 million and give it to the landlords and there are no evictions. That's the problem with city leadership. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Now, am I biased or does that make sense to me? Pay the landlords, then there's no evictions. They're still gonna be evicted, but now the attorneys are making the money, right? So that's why I think most of the council members are attorneys, right? Follow the money, they're all friends, it's unfortunate. It just makes no sense uh, how that's being run. And unfortunately, it's not helping the, the residents facing eviction. So that's my spiel on LA City. Any questions on that? Ron, do you keep like a line item for legal fees for evictions? Do you keep a, you've got yeah. an annual budget for, you know, like we're gonna spend a hundred grand a year on eviction. Yeah, so we, it's called like, you know, contingency number uh, uh, event. And yeah, so, you know, good luck trying to, <laughs> Figure what that is. Right? Yeah, right. but we'll take averages and then budget accordingly. Yeah. Good question. All right, now we're going into expenses. Oh, that's still revenue. All right, I'm not going to bore you too much. You see subcategories. By the way, all these account codes, they're different for every operator. These are customized, right? So you, you get the general idea income with all your expenses. But the thing I want to show you is total expenses, which are expenses before non incur non -incur. Okay, so down here, bottom. total operating expenses. I want everyone, I mentioned expense income ratio, huge KPI on industry. If you have a calculator on your phone or your computer, is that a phone? Is it the full TIP? Oh, hell yeah. Okay, so that's right. Uh, take your total expenses here. Nine fifty. Oh, can you see it? It's probably small. Nine fifty four one ninety five. I'm going to give you the calculation, and then you are an expert operator, or at least analyzer. Divide it by for the year one uh, one nine three sixteen one seventy nine. What do you get? Seventy three five. What is it? Seventy-two point five percent. Anyone else? Seventy-two five. Seventy-two percent. All right. Something didn't. Something didn't work out there. I'm gonna make sure. So three. Did you guys use the? Oh, hold on. Yeah. No. Nine. Nine fifty-four. Right. 
got to love when a plan comes together. And the 1.3. Yeah, so go minus one and that'll get you your expense. Um, the hell? That's interesting. So anyway, we're about 27% is the expense to income ratio, right? Which is the, let me make sure I'm got my right numbers. 1.3 million and it was 300,000. Yeah. Yeah. So that's about right. Just under 30%, right? Yeah. 27. There you go. So 27%. Is that good or bad? Who knows? It's Moss operating. It's got to be good. I'm not going to come with a bad example, right? <laughs> uh, in the industry, your average, if you're looking at a deal, do not go any less than 40%. 40%. Some will argue it's higher now because of inflation. 40 to 45% expense income ratio. If they show you less, yes, market higher. Now, why is this? Though? Because we're that good? Yes, and uh, this building has been on forever, so there's tax basis is so. If someone's buying today, you're going to see another 13 percent difference in the, in the tax. So that's the difference. 40 is my key. Number. I love using 40. So that means are some buildings operating more than 40? Absolutely. Why? You got to dig in and find out. Are some less? Absolutely. But taxes, guys, on these on, on these values it becomes a huge factor. Where the property taxes, generally speaking, now when we're looking at new construction, is about 50% of the total income. So if it's a 20% to income ratio, just taxes only, you figure double it, it's about 40. So taxes are about 50% of the expense, property tax. So if you've got a low tax base somewhere, get it. How do you change it? No, not to avoid that. But um, it just shows you how much is going to that damn city of ours. <laughs> um, any questions on expense income ratio? 40%, that's the big number. So bottom line, what I wanted you to do also, when you look at, remember NOI is the uh, is part of our valuation calculation. Let's see here. NOI before non-recurring. All right, fine. We'll use that number. NOI before non non recurring expenses. We have some non recurring that one plan that we put below the line. Not a detail. But bottom line, I want you to do a calculation for me. You'll see the difference three percent in NOI. So we increase, put more money, right? Thirty one thousand nine sixty. Put thirty one thousand uh, more money or more cash into the client's pocket when you compare it year over year. Without doing rent increases, it's pretty pretty good. Uh, so this client would be a raving fan. That's our goal. But what I want to illustrate the point is take your annual NOI. So take this number. I'm going to do two sides of the room. Everyone on this side. Take that number. Number NOI divided by what is value? Cap rate? So now let's mess with cap rate for a second. You guys take that NOI number divided by five. So divided by 0 0.055. This side of the room, we're going to divide it by four and a half. Yeah. 0 0.045. We're going to start with today's cap rate. It's probably going to be closer to mid fives, five to five five. What would be the value of this building, everyone on this side? 17.3 million, five and a half cap. Four and a half cap, what do you guys have? Cap rate is big deal. 1%. What'd you guys say? 20. 21 for 17. Holy smokes. Can you imagine if those interest rates go back down? Sell. But that's huge, right? In valuation. Now take the same cap rates, drop this number to 750. 750,000. We're going to pretend this was 2015. 750 divided by the same capital. 554. 554, what do we got? 
13-6 and a lot has a big deal. 16. 16. Is that a cool exercise? So take 100 bucks. So take 120 bucks. So that's 10,000 a month. 120,000 divided by uh, five and a half. Take the same 120 divided by four. What do we got over here? 2.9. So in your mind, in a five and a half cap rate environment, every 10,000 I increase per month, 120 for the year, I'm increasing 2 million. What's your guess? 2.7. 2.7. That's the power of control and NOI. And of course, that. Isn't that cool? So there's nothing I love more. You guys tell probably could tell at the beginning, I'm, I love people who want to help, blah, blah, blah. I try to, I don't know how to, but um, there's nothing I love more than two things in this business, hiring and putting them in place and watching this, take it to them. Just empowering that employee with class. That's a piece. Two, getting a new client, putting our systems in place, increasing their NOI by whatever dollar amount, because you see the compound effect when it comes to value. So, you know, we talk about as our goal in our organization is create rate and finance. What if I called you and said, your building is now 1.2 million higher in value? It'd be a rate of that's right. That's right. So that's the point I wanted to illustrate with this and the importance of NOI, which basically means efficient operation. And that's what we talked about at the beginning um, when it came to operation and inefficiencies. Any questions on this? By the way, for those that want to know, this is a 54-unit building on uh, just uh, one block east of Robertson, so Beverly Hills adjacent, as we say. Any questions on the numbers, on what we just reviewed, the power of cap rates and NOI, the power of efficient operation? What? Software. Great question. Great question. Now we have a slide on tech and, and all that stuff. But to your question is Yardi. You guys heard of Yardi? So Yardi is probably the biggest in the industry. There's a lot of good ones coming up though. Appfolio is one. Um, Intrada is up and coming. Yardi is kind of the, the big gorilla in, in the industry, been around the biggest. Um, but, but then there's other really cool technologies we'll get to later, but that's the main software technology. All right, 2.30, I'm having fun. I, I feel like we could go till five. What do you guys say? Yeah, 5.30, we'll bring in dinner. I'll buy them dinner, get some steaks. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, Tony, yeah, whatever. Do they still have the tower pizza here? Yeah. Heck yeah. All right, we had some stories at tower. Um, all right, back to work. Sorry. Oh, wait, here we go. What do I have to hit? The presentation? From beginning. Oh. Sorry, no, from beginning? Slide. Oh, right here? From okay. current slide. Thank you. All these software uh, upgrades have changed over the years. <clears throat> All right, five categories. So now you can take this in any business. Any business runs on these. It used to be five. I added a sixth. Product place, price, promotion, people. You guys do the marketing thing in business. You hear all about that. Do they teach processes? That's my addition. Process. All business is is a process. If you figure out that process, you could scale. That's business. Business is a process, right? So that's why I get, I really enjoy processes and efficiency and operation and trying to do things better at the end of the day. So product, it is what it is. Real estate, what asset type? Is it retail, multifamily? Is it class A, B, or C? Fancy word for you know brand new construction versus older, A, B, or C, A being the best. Um, in real estate, how much influence do you have on the uh, asset type as an operator, not what you're looking to buy? Are you gonna change the asset type? Well, we are in one case. Where, where, where were we talking? Where'd he go? Oh, there you are, right in the middle. Uh, they're changing an office building uh, and putting into multifamily. So in that case, they are changing. 
but generally speaking, are you going to change retail into apartments, right? Whatever you're operating. So do you have little, you have very little influence on, on the product or the asset type, right? At the end of the day, when we take on a building to operate, it's class B, it's apartments, right? It is what it is. Place. Can I pick up the building and move it? Yeah, maybe. But how much influence there? It is where it is, right? So you could focus on taking on properties or buying properties in a certain place, but you're not going to have much influence from an operation. We're thinking from an operation standpoint. Price. We already talked about highest possible right, um, rents, lowering expenses. Um, but in, in we talked about earlier, how do you increase revenue? Someone said increase your rents. How do you know what to rent it for? Anyone? Comps. Everyone know that? Look for similar to product type in the same area. Determine what, what your values are uh, in your rents. So pricing, you can move the pricing. That's usually very important in, um, in the business. So I always look at these, these uh, six categories as if a, if a building is not performing, right? We have all our KPIs, something's off. This is what we do to go down. We look at what's the price? Are we asking too much? Is that the issue for occupancy, right? When you look at the comps, make the determination, no, you move on. Promotion, how are we marketing it? Promotion, very simple. It's a simple formula. More traffic, higher price, right? The more people you come to get, look at your apartments, the higher price you're gonna get for them. So then we're looking at how are we marketing? Is there an issue with the marketing? Are we marketing in the right, with the right sources, et cetera? So that's your promotion and, and marketing. If the, the price is right and the marketing is right, then we gotta look into the people, the onsite teams. Are they accessible? Are they answering the phone? Are they smiling, right? Are they giving good customer service? Um, or are they clocking out early, right? And, and not working. Um, so you're always looking at the people. And this is where the people management come, comes into play uh, when we talked about at the beginning from property versus asset management. Um, Let's see here. Oh, this is, I think, uh, let's see if it plays. Speaking of people, this is one of our now regions. Oh, shoot. No volume. Forget about it. Anyway, this is a little cool video that we did uh, a while ago. And she's just talking about our culture, you know, attracting talent, et cetera. All right. And then the, the last category I added is processes. Because it's so important, not only in, in real estate operation, but really any business at, at the end of the day. Uh, we have a thing, got it from Tony Robbins called Canny, constantly or constant and never ending improvement, right? I love that. Uh, it's a challenge to all of our teams, all of our department heads on how can we improve our processes? How can we be more efficient? Because the more efficient we are, the higher value, as we talked about, you know, the properties are, the more raving fans we will have uh, from a client standpoint. So I think those questions kind of speak for themselves. But, you know, also looking at technology, since you mentioned that, you know, what technology is out there that could improve processes as well? And as I mentioned, because of the influx of investment that came into our industry, there are a lot, the technology followed, right? A lot of startups uh, that I'll be happy to talk about as well, because um I think they're all local now. The Silicon Beach is uh, is bringing them all in. Here are just a couple examples of KPIs, key performance indicators that we talked about before. Occupancy, we said is number one red flag. Uh, collections, COVID became, collections was never second, but during COVID collections became second and service and accessibility. That's just basic customer service. All these things we measure on a daily basis and, and check them out on a monthly basis. Um, and then also some financial measurements that we already talked about with the p l We got year over year rent growth, total uh, revenue growth, and then of that expense to income ratio that, that we reviewed. Those are just some of the main KPIs that we look at from an operation standpoint. One of my favorites though, is that uh, service and accessibility. We have, to give you an example, and this goes back to technology and, and measuring, it's hard to measure customer service right uh, from afar. So we have, uh, as a company, anywhere from twelve to fifteen thousand leasing calls a year, or a year, a week. So that's every week. Is it weekly? It is weekly. I was thinking monthly. That sounded right. Twelve to fifteen thousand a week. 
make 12 to 50,000 calls. We receive leasing. leasing calls. Right. So when so we measure, right, the technology is out there. You measure all the calls. You measure how many of those are answered. If you have an issue with occupancy, I guarantee you there's an issue of accessibility or your team answering the phone. It's an amazing correlation. So bottom line, it's utilizing technology to understand where your issues are so you could jump on them before they become issues. And that's just the customer service uh, in general. Okay, here we go, technology. What do we wanna focus on here? Centralized leasing and lead tracking, that's what I was just talking about. A company called uh, Rent Dynamics, they were just purchased by Entrada for probably 100 million. So that would have been cool to be a part of that, right? So all you technology folks were in the right spot where you could find some of these companies and, and see who could reach them from. That was the lease tracking that we talked about. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight two more, and the one is not here. Demuso. Demuso, we found probably six years ago, and all it was was a, a payment you know, uh, program. So uh, an electronic payment. But they had guaranteed funds when there wasn't guaranteed funds electronically, right? So back in the day, they moved in funds. You know, you have to the bank get a cashier check, you know, money order, something like that. And those, you know, it could be fraudulent now these days. So the Muso has, you can pay credit card, you can pay ACH so like everyone now, but they have the guaranteed funds at the beginning. I'm sure others do now, but it put them on the map. So they're one of the leading, um, companies in the industry and, and friends of ours, we were one of their first customers. Uh, so they've just grown gangbusters and they're out of Santa Monica. Uh, so that was a great technology. Another thing we were faced with, you know, talking about efficiency, we talked about the expense of evictions. One of the things we were faced with in the whole industry was, was fraudulent applications, you know, uh, fake IDs, uh, ID theft uh, as well, right? This type of thing. So, Long story short, screening companies, they were getting sued, so they didn't want to give you too much information. So bottom line, if we put someone in with you know wrong identity, they're not paying, right? And then the six months of eviction and expense kicks in. That could ruin your, your P&L. So we needed a solution. Company that started in New York is now in uh, Venice, I believe, somewhere somewhere here, so it's not, I think Venice or Santa Monica, uh, called Two Dots. Two Dots or Two Dots, one of the two. Uh, and what they did is all the requirements we have in our screening process that the resident uploads onto the Yardi system and the screen, right? You might have to upload your copy of your ID, you know, maybe bank statements, depending, or, you know, pay stubs, proof of income, this type of thing. They have some genius that came from Google that was all the document reading. So they could tell if the document is fraudulent. And just by a red light, green light for our on site staff of whether it's real or it's not. Which I'll give you another cool example using their technology. We hired someone during this, you know, through COVID, COVID, three years ago. Worked for us for a week, gave HR a COVID letter that they're out, they have COVID. We're like, it seems real. We gave it to two dots to run the document. The document was two years old and just written over two days prior. They're like, oh, busted, you're gone, you know? But isn't that cool technology? So all of this stuff really helps um, how to operate. So if we could avoid one, 2%, you know, of, of the total applications coming in that are fraudulent, it's a huge difference maker from an NOI and cash flow standpoint. Uh, but anyway, my point is here, really cool technology in the industry. Um, so you could do some research there if that uh, if that interests you as well. Let me see here. Some more technology. These are all things that uh, increase services, features for rents. Yes, sir. Yes, it's coming. Um, we're already using it in the leasing process. The question was AI uh, as an example. So we have AI on text messages, emails for immediate response that can answer questions. So that's being utilized, trying to improve efficiency for the, uh, the on-site teams. Um, AI is that two dots, that's all AI, you know, computer generated, you're right. 
of computer learning for, for documents. Um, what else did you mention other than AI? Yeah, yeah, huge effect, huge effect in, in positive ways. Probably more ways than we know, right? Because it's still so new. But, um, you know, and then you get all these companies, new technologies coming out saying, hey, we can do this, that. And you got to be careful, you know, not to get burned and, you know, make that decision too quickly. But yeah, AI will change. Uh, by raise of hand, this is just a, my own survey from my own audit. If you're interested in apartments, would you A, go to the website first or go visit in person? A or B. A, raise your hand. Well, so, right? so you can post After you go to the website and you're interested, do you A, text, B, email, C, call, and D, other than I'm not knowing that. A, B, C, or D. Text, email, call, or something else. What would you do? I call. 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 Okay, so A. Let's see your A. Is any text messages? Uh, any emails? B. Oh, I get some emails. Okay. Uh, C, call. A lot of calls. What? That's good. I just learned something. Good job. Uh, thank you for sharing. And that's all that's all part of right marketing and 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 how to get people in into uh, into leasing. Um, let's see here. That's another video that's not going to work. Oh, oh, we're getting to the end. Now we're going to get into mindset. Oh, it's a different one. Okay. All right. So since the video isn't working, I'd love to invite uh, a good friend uh, and coworker, Brian Felton. Brian, as I mentioned, is VP of service. Um, the good news is, Brian, I took up a lot of time. <laughs> so you probably have, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, whatever you want. And then I want to talk a little bit more on mindset, which I'm missing a slide. I'll find it, though. Um, we talked about some of the mindset stuff in, in some books. Uh, I'll announce the, the book thing again. And then we'll go questions, discussions, anything, you know, save, for, save some time for the end. And whenever we're done, we're done. But with that, uh, thank you, Brian, for being here. And the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I have a class or two in here a long time ago. I know Chris had mentioned kind of uh, the history and our, our connection here with LMU. I'm also a 2001 graduate. Um, I've worked for a Mossy company for 10 plus years now um, with a, a variety of different uh, titles, uh, some accounting, some operations. Now I've worked in service, which I think uh, if we're going to strip it all down, that's what we do. And that service really is to benefit two different parties or two different businesses. Chris talked a lot about the asset management of the client, the building owner. And of course, there's, uh, you know, ways to impact that too. But I, on the other side, and we deal with this uh, on a daily basis, is the resident, right? We always talk about when we enter someone's apartment, that's their home, how do we treat that um, with the utmost respect, right? To create a raving fan, but also to just be, understand the human element of it, right? And when things go wrong in the apartment building, right, the resident is dealing with you know, a lot of things that don't work in there necessarily intending to be a part of their day, right? So how do we uh, mitigate that? Um, from the resident side, I think it's it's personal. It's it's your relationship, your on-site relationship with their with their tenants. You know, for from to my level it's my relationships that I've built over the years with vendors that can come in and, and help us with that stuff, plumbers, uh, elevator service, right? You're locking your elevator, you're not probably not too happy. It's not your fault, but someone's got to get the doors open, right? So, you know, um, in just kind of developing the, those over the year. And I think those things have changed, right? We have contractors. You know, we've ran contractors through, uh, you know, my 10 years. Many, many, many different contractors. You know that too. Uh, there are challenges there, but overall, right? It's a, it's it's about creating a great experience for the resident, right? So we do that by you know things being safe, some things being clean, um, and uh, handling everything in an efficient manner. So we've leveraged some different technologies. So my, the smartphone is where all of my tech technicians, all of my service technicians will get anything that we, that we 
uh, want to assign to them, right? And that will include a picture of maybe voice memos, things to give them a good idea about what they're wanting. So we've got our order supplies, you know, our leveraging our relationships with our supply people can get delivery. If I order something at nine o'clock in the morning, I can get it at three in the afternoon, which means in theory, I could turn around that experience in 24 hours, right? You guys all live in apartments or dorms or whatever, I'm assuming, right? What an impact that would be to you, right? Oh, you called at nine o'clock in the morning, sent an email, made a phone call, and that boss of that would be can just fix that out, right? Good goal, pretty challenging in a lot of different uh, respects. But when we think about our company, right? Chris talked about all the time, all the time, all the time is occupancy. It's our number one driver of how successful our clients, right? Well, the occupant has to be happy, right? And that's our goal service wise. How do we create you know, the 25, 30 people in this room, how do we build on our reputation as a company in this class supply and great value in your experience? Not necessarily in your financials, like it would be from the client, but from the customer, right? What constitutes a great experience there? Challenging in a lot of different respects, right? You know, I'll give you a good one, right? This last year, the only time I can remember it raining as much, and I've lived in LA my entire life, the only time I remember remain, or, uh, raining as much as it did last winter was maybe the winter of 2000 or uh, 1997 when we were freshmen here. But what that does impact wise for my department is hey, the one's got water leaking into their apartment. It's Christmas, it's New Year's, it's cold out. Like, how, do we, how do we help these people? What do we do? Well, I got to leverage every one of the roofers that I that I have potentially. I got to put a system in place that has me following up with these different, you know, incidents that have occurred to make sure that we don't have anything fall through the cracks. Because the other service that I provide is to the client. University in Berkeley, they had a balcony class. Maybe you remember that. It's maybe 15 years ago. So now statewide, we have to make sure that structurally all these all these uh, pieces are sound. All right. Well, a balcony on Venice Beach next to the water is going to be have a lot different lifespan than maybe a, a, a balcony downtown LA or newly built, right? As you know, you get pests or weather or whatever impact that. What else happens around here that we got to be a heads up for? Uh, earthquakes, right? Making sure that the buildings, you know, it, it's interesting if you read about uh, Los Angeles on a basin, it's on a bedrock, it's a moving surface underneath, you know, geologically. I know we're getting out, off topic here, but that affects how, you know, things will roll through when the, the, the ground starts to shake. So we have to really enforce that. That's a city compliance. So those are just two right there. Fire, obviously, but three big ones with the city that we need to make sure we're on top of because of Chris's main thing today. That's how we add value to our clients, right? That also adds value to our residents. They may not like me knocking on their door at nine o'clock in the morning to make sure that their balcony is, is safe, but they'd rather me do it than not to, I would think, right? And that's that's really where we're going with, with that stuff. Yeah, question. With services and structural integrity of the property, is this something that you kind of work on more based off of uh, like compliances, like government compliances, or is this more just like on a property by property basis looking at the specific things there? Yeah, I, th I think it's twofold, right? So there are there are city or state compliance things, or maybe even federal things that we have to adhere to. Um, but then there's also things that we can recommend, right? So in a building that is maybe older. They're using a type of plumbing that is galvanized, tends to corrode and crack, right? That produces a leak. We can go give the recommendation to have that upgraded to a, a higher durability copper, which is proactive, right? But 
the, re the, the investment model has to be a fit for it, right? So if I go to a mom and pop uh, investor like Chris was alluding to, and I say, hey, you know what you really should do is invest 30 grand in your plumbing. They usually don't have it, right? So then it's kind of a piecemeal thing you got to put together. So when we're looking at different investments, oftentimes we're looking at what those investment strategies are. Because if I have a mom and pop, they're looking at that as income. Or maybe if I have an institutional client, they want to invest into the property, which means I can spend to proactively fix these things. Right. So it's some of that give and take, right? That why, you know, what makes a person want to re-up their rent, right? Part of my, my success is renewals. Their residents are staying at a building. And think about your own residencies. You like a certain aspect of it. Maybe it's roomy, maybe it's you know, something something cosmetically within the unit, but ultimately, right, how everything works for you. Do they have some of these services that make your life easier? Who pays their rent online? A lot more people do now than they did five years ago, right? And 10 years ago, right? Or or making sure I can get a, a maintenance technician to you in 24 hour period. Well, that's on an app now. I'm 44 years old. There were no apps 10 years ago. The iPhone's only 2006, but think about your world in that time and how much it's changed. And then think about my world in that time and how much it's changed to adapt to what you guys are expecting as our consumer, right? So that, you know, creating that experience from the, the, the consumer level and then also tying that or intertwining that with a great experience or financial returns for the, for the landlord is kind of our gray area where we can get into those PL sheets, right? Because I can go and present an EV charging station plan where maybe it's grant funded by the city or you know, we can do a bidding process with three different contractors on your retrofit to find the one that slots in best price-wise for you. Or maybe you want that, maybe you're late to the party on, on that, some of that compliance, you need something done quicker. So now I need a vendor that can fulfill what you need in your time frame, which isn't always the case, right? If we got everyone looking at balconies because the initiatives, you know, coming at the end of the year, how much more leverage have I potentially can I work with when I'm not up against the timetable at the end of the year, right? And I work with different contractors in this time frame. So things like that. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you, can you talk a little bit about <clears throat> how much are you using third-party vendors? Like, do you have a central dispatch for all of these? I forget how many doors you have. Right? 15,000. Okay. It's a great so, question, actually. And it's yeah. one that Chris... And I and our company debates a lot, right? So what do we do? We have readily available, right? We like to say your number one ability is your reliability or your availability, right? And that and that matters a lot, right? Can I get somebody there in quick order? Because if I call a third party vendor, I don't have that influence. I can't say, hey, move me to the top of your list. I can if I've been working with him for you know two decades, all right, and we're the the lion's share of of his revenue volume. Now I have influence. Now I can say, get over there right now. I need you right now, right? And they're more apt to do that. Now that's where I think our business unit kind of slots in. We have internal services that I can provide, but then it's those relationships that you build over the course of time that really impact you because a lot of it is specialty stuff. I don't know where to, you know, when the La Brea tar pits are leaking oil into the water line at a building, that's new to me. I don't know how to fix that, right? but I have resources available to me to then figure out a solution. I think that's probably a big thing to take away too, right? When we talk about your mindset, I talk, you know, I talk, guys call me all day long. I can't fix it. I can't, well, have you tried? You know, I have a 10 year old son, have you tried, right? right? Because if you explore more options, right? And you swing and miss a little bit, you're gonna find avenues to get to what you need. You're just being resourceful. That's an important part of any kind of successful plan. Right. Hey, be able to take it on the chin a little bit and get back up and try it again is important quality to have. Um, as it relates to to third party vendors, we don't like to use them, right? Because in a lot of times, you know, we're billing our clients for the guys that I put there, right? So if they can't do the job, now we're doubling up, which isn't decreasing expenses, right? That's not a value add if I have a guy like that. Now, if I have, you know, Johnny, you know, that knows everything, 
that guy's valuable to me. That guy, I'm going to pay more because I want to be able to plug him in wherever I need him. And then his reputation and what he's done for us helps our reputation, right? And provides a good experience, right? So really what I want is I want a Johnny that smiles all the time, wears his uniform, right? Shows up on time and can do anything across the board, right? So if you guys have those or you are those, I have my car right here. We need a lot more of those, right? But in any organization, how well someone does their job is a part of the growth of that company or, you know, as Chris alluded to, being able to, to scale our business, I need to promote a good product. The product that I have is my people, right? Yes, we can save you on supply costs because we have leveraged purchasing power with some of that stuff. But ultimately, the guy that goes into your, your apartment and doesn't, you know, take care of the drywall at each room, you're going to be not too happy about that, right? So I need the guy that's conscious about how he's interacting with the client part of it, the expense part of it, but also understands that when he goes into an apartment, he's going into someone's home and he's got to be respectful with that. So those are, you know, tough finds, right? And the more we can get them, the more we try and acquire them. Yeah. So um, any other questions about, you know, customer service? I didn't figure I'd get too many questions. It's not sexy, right? But it can be, right? Because I think, right, when you go in and, and you are that that person that has a positive impact in someone else's life, that's what you're ultimately trying to do, right? Yes, it's nice to make money in business, but that's how you're going to be remembered or your reputation is going to grow. Hey, when I interacted with John or I interacted with Chris, how'd that go for me, right? Well, if that's a positive experience, I'm going to go back to that well again and again. And again. So. Yeah, question. So I'm hearing like products that are being proactive is a really important part of like maintaining like you got like a multi-family, like maintaining like every single unit is being proactive and just making sure you know you're not against the timetable, as you said. Yeah, so here's a so here's a good example of that. So we do inspections on every unit, right? But we do that and we force it on the owners because most people won't tell you if they have a problem until that problem is too big and they have to tell you, right? Well, if I'm an owner and I can go in and I can fix a $250 faucet, or I'm going to have six months later a $30,000 remediation, right? It's in my best interest to go here and make sure that I don't have a lot of this stuff going on, right? Understanding the age of my building, understanding, you know, things that are going on around it, understanding the time of year, right? If I am not cleaning out my rain gutter, it sounds silly, right? But there's a lot of trees that bring a lot of stuff into your pipes, into your drains, all that stuff. Right. If you are not out in front of that, you're going to have a problem, right? Or that owner is going to have a problem. Now, the ones that recognize that and say, "Hey, you know, I'd rather you know moss get in there and take it, take a look at this stuff for me," than you know have four remediation six months from now that are going to cost me a quarter of a million dollars. You know, I think that's a pretty easy decision. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Anybody else? So, yeah, I'll turn it back over to the man here. Um, one of the things that I hear him saying a lot today to you guys, and I've heard this before, I hear it at work, right, is how you think about it, right? So if you're thinking in a positive way, you're going to act in a positive way. And when you get those things going, they have momentum, I think, is a big thing that I've learned from him. You know, it's a, it's nice to be able to pay it forward to you guys, and he's got a lot of knowledge, and I suggest... Um, that should always be what you're, you're chasing down is right. How to figure something out and how to use it to your advantage. So thanks for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Felt. Uh, he has a lot of responsibility. You can imagine a lot of calls. He gets calls from me a lot, unfortunately. but that's just the nature of the business. So thanks for uh, sharing that great questions. Uh, so a couple things I want to do. Uh, I'm going to guess it'll be about 15 minutes, and then we'll get into uh, discussion. Any more questions uh, for you guys? We could end a little early in case I know there's a couple of meetings that we want to meet up after, but we're almost done. So deep breath, drink some water. Um, I don't know if I'm going to find my darn slide. So I don't know why, but the uh, Zoom crashed. So I put it up. Oh, you laptop. have it? Okay. I put it from my laptop. So I'm not sure if you want to find it real quick right here. But you can just grab on that.
All right, for everyone on Zoom, what do we have? Like ten thousand people on Zoom. Uh, we had seven. We lost two of them when it crashed. Seven thousand. Just seven. Just <laughs> <laughs> lie on it. Screw it off. I'm sorry, and I, I like realizing it's only. Seven All right, uh, you know, it's a simple slide. I don't see it, but um, here's the point. Everyone had something to type with, something to write with. Um, this is a pretty cool story. And I don't know whether we go goals and that mindset. Let's go mindset first. Mindset is very simple um, concept, but very hard to master. So one of my favorite quotes from the man, Tony Robbins, is, and check this out, really great meaning. Your quality of life is dependent on the quality of your emotional state. That says everything. If you believe that, then boy, oh boy, manage that emotional state. And all that is is energy. So we'll talk about how to control emotional state. But that quote has always stuck with me. Because no matter what happens in life, if you focus on being in the right state of mind or emotional state, you're going to get through anything. And more importantly, in the right emotional state, you're going to achieve your goals to your wildest dreams. And I've learned that 2018. I go, yeah. If someone would have told me that in school. So that's my gift to you today. Now that sounds really flipping basic. I get it. But write it down and don't forget it. Now we're going to talk about emotional state. Emotional state, again, is just that. Your, your state of mind. Everyone knows if you're, let's say, for example, if you, if you had to drive here, if you took the freeway, I came down the 405 from Sherman Oaks. If I'm in a poor emotional state, down, low energy, I'll say pissed off. Someone cuts me off, what's my reaction? You're cursing out them. I'm, I'm like out of my mind, right? Now, if I'm in a great emotional state, smiling, got MJ on, dancing, and someone cuts me off, same scenario, what's my reaction? You go, oh, guy's in a hurry. I hope he gets there safe, <laughs> right? The point is, there's the same thing happened in life. The only difference was your emotional state. We all get down. If you could realize it and know how to get it back up through three things, I'll give you that secret, then life is going to be amazing. It's that simple. And I know you're going to say this is BS. I've lived it. I've flipped and lived it. And it's amazing. And I'm going to give you a great example before we get into our goal writing here in a second, because I do it every year also. And I'll tell you what I wrote down in November of 2022 and what happened in November of 2023. Before, now I got you on, and now I got your attention. So emotional state, three things to control it. Number one, physiology, how you use your body. If uh, my head is down, my shoulders are down, right? I'm not smiling. I'm using my voice. How am I going to feel? Down, right? Just by using your body, shoulders back, chest out, deep breaths, scientifically proven actually to increase testosterone for guys. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. That's how powerful. The mind is. So basically, you're doing, you're using tools to, I don't want to say trick, but to manipulate your mind in feeling better. It helps control emotional state. So using your body physiology to control your state. There was a big book on, uh, I read it, I forget what it's called, but literally you could trick your body by smiling. You could trick your mind just by the act of smiling. So if you're down, just smile. Smile in the mirror, all of a sudden, wow, you, you feel great again. So the point is you could feel however we want because anything that happens in life, everything is the meaning we give it. I've sat in front of employees before in my office that were having trouble 
and I'm trying to like pour into them, like, look, we're going to get through this. You can do this, right? And giving them ways of improvement, him or her. They give it the meaning of, oh, he doesn't like me, I'm being attacked. This is why, every reason why it's not going to happen. They're, they're giving it the wrong meaning. It's their fault, right? They're, they're getting in their own way. I see it time and time again. So the point is, emotional state, how you use your physiology, smiling, shoulders back, et cetera. That will trick your mind or manipulate your mind, which is a good thing in a positive manner. Uh, number two, focus. Tony says, where focus goes, energy flows. What are you focusing on? So my wife was at a sales meeting. She's in the medical world. And she comes back. We have three boys. I forgot to mention my family introduction. How oh, shame on me. I got three boys uh, and a wife. Uh, 14, 12, and 10. So she's gone all week. So I'm making breakfast, making dinner, uh, laundry, you name it, right? I'm getting everything done. She walks in. What do you think she said? Oh, kitchen's clean, by the way. Dishes are done. Dishwasher's even unloaded. I mean, I was, I was, I impressed myself. You know what she said when she walked in through the garage door right in the kitchen? And that's where I am. Like, look at this place. She goes, You didn't clean the garage? <laughs> and I, what do you think I said? No joke. Tony Robbins, what do you think I said? Change your focus, <laughs> right? Change your focus. She's focused on the damn garage. And, it, and yeah, it's a mess. So she's coming in, focusing on the garage. Oh man, the garage is a mess. Wait a minute. Focus on the dishes, the kitchen, the laundry, the kids are alive. Yeah. <laughs> Focus on something else, right? Totally change your state. So I am the master. I feel bad for them. And my kids. I'm the master of changing focus. I tell them all the time change your physiology. My kid on his phone, right? The shoulders. Hey, change your posture. Right, smile. So it's non stop and it's reminders, but change your focus immediately. I mean, all you guys right now are smiling, right? All you did was change your focus, right? My wife called me out on the garage, pretty funny. But anyway, so physiology and focus, too. Number three, change your language. We don't even realize, and it's some stat I've read, and I'm going to butcher it, but it's something like there's 2,000 words the second to the minute that are going through our minds subconsciously. And it's a powerful voice. We have to control it. Otherwise our minds are going on some changing our focus, affecting our, our emotional state. So you know there's like this positive self-talk similar to that, right? But the point is be aware of what you're feeding your mind. Be aware of that clip video on your phone. Be aware of whichever side of the aisle on all that stuff coming at you, firing you up and making you focus by re reading these words, right? And then the language starts going, and it's usually pretty negative. Um, so changing your language, it could be, could be anything, just describing a situation, right? After this class, you could go back to your friends and say, oh, it was horrible. Oh, change your language, right? Horrible. What happens when you say horrible? Everybody, right? You'd say it wasn't that bad, but we had fun. A little better, right? The point is the language you use, a lot of the self-talk subconsciously is going to change your emotional state. So you got to be aware of it. That's the point. So physio, not in no particular order, by the way. It's called the triad, Tony Robbins triad. Focus, physiology, and language. Watch yourself. When you get into a, a low point, change your language, change your focus, and, and change your posture, and you'll come right out of it. it it's, a, it's like a muscle. That's how Tony described it. It's working out. It's muscle of the mind. It's more than doing it once. You're not going to master it. But the more you do it, the better you get at it, and then you become great at it. So work on it, and don't take it for granted. Tell me. It's the most simple thing to do. I know it sounds really elementary. I'm telling you, it'll change your life and it'll change mine. You guys ready to write down goals? Yeah. So as you write down goals, we're going to have, and you're not going to share them, so don't worry. These are your own personal goals. 
when we're when we do goal setting, I want you to think of different categories of life. Right. So you're going to have different goals for different categories. As it's described, basically think of a wheel and each between each spoke or whatever is a category of life. If you put too much effort and goals into, let's say, work, career, right, you're not going to have balance from the rest of the categories. And think about wheel. It's not going to be a very smooth ride, right? So everyone has different number of categories. I think when I did this, I think I came up with seven to give you some examples of categories. Career, so business, personal finance, family, maybe father. I put family together, so father, husband, goals. Um, shoot, I'm going blank. Physical, physical health, health goals. Physical. Big, yeah. Yeah, physical. Oh, I'm going blank. Name some others, guys. Vacation, home. Home, vacation. What up? Personal. Relationships. Relationships. In the back. Personal skills. Personal skills. Self development. So you don't have to use them all. Those are just some examples, and you might add some. And I'm going blank on on, on my other ones. But um, the point is, you'll have different goals for each category. So what's nice is you, and of course, you got to put it somewhere where you're going to look at. It. What's nice is you'll check some things off on these categories. And by looking at it, you look at the other categories and say, where have I to focus lately? I need to go do something over there. And it feels good when you stay on top of it. So we're going to have one-year goals in those categories. And when you do these, when we do this exercise, don't think. Don't be perfect. Everyone wants to be perfect. And so you sit there and don't write anything. Be as imperfect as you can. Write whatever comes to your mind. If, so, if someone says private jet, write down private jet. Don't, don't limit yourself mentally. Right? You want a big 100-foot yacht? Write it down. Who cares? Whatever comes to your mind, write it down. All the different categories, we have one-year goals and we have five-year goals. Most people overestimate what they could do in a year, but underestimate what they could do in five. So keep that in mind. I'm going to put some music on. And by the way, don't even worry about like the one year category and five year category. Just put it all on paper. You could go through and sort which ones you want to put in one year versus five year. Make sense? Everyone just keep writing. I'm going to try to find some inspiring music. No, Michael? Uh, I know. Right? Uh, here we go. Keep writing. Different categories of life. Family, relationships, school. I know about that one. Well, it's too fast to prepare for things. Tripping in the world could be dangerous. Everybody circling his vulture rings, negative, negative. Everybody waiting for the father man. Even if you don't know what category you put it, let's write it down. Figure that out later. Don't even burn us more for this.
All right, we're going to keep going. If you're not done, feel free to keep writing. And certainly, you could take that exercise home with you. You'll want to put everything in certain categories when you have a moment, and then also determine is it a one year goal or a five year goal? Key is you got to look at these things, right? I put it in my closet on the closet door, so I see it every day uh, for the annual goals. And it's always good to go back at them, you know, add to them, change them if you need to, you know, throughout the year. But the whole point of writing it down, the mind takes over. Don't ask me what it is, but it will manifest itself. You guys ready to hear what happened in November of 23? Yeah. I wrote it down. My goal is November of 2022. It was in my closet. Half sheet of paper. Taped up. And one of my goals I wrote down was buy yourself a cyber trip. That's it. Yeah. That's your goal. It's not your goal. So, you guys saw it. So, I, I, <laughs> so I wrote it down, treat yourself to a cyber trip. How many flipping orders? Are there out there assigned trucks? I got a call in November of 2023 and said, Would you like one of the first ones? I said, I would love to go. Of course. I was in Austin on November 30th on stage with Elon, shaking Elon's hand and getting him to one of the first cyber trucks delivered in the US. Oh, 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 Is that oh. effing amazing? That's pretty. Nobody. And it was written down 12 months prior. I'm telling you, I get the chills just thinking about it. Something about laying it down and seeing it and focusing on it and working on your mental state, you will manifest stuff that are beyond your wildest dreams. So take it and try it. That's all I'm asking. Don't give up on it. If Tony, who is the master of all these books, and what I love about Tony is he reads from everyone and learns, and he just shortens it all down and puts it in to an event for you to be that much better, right? Condenses all this research that he's got. And if he says that your quality of life is dependent on your emotional state, the quality of your emotional state, I mean, holy smokes. And that's something you can control with those three tools I gave you. I wish somebody told me that, as I said earlier, when I was in, in school. I wish I didn't have to wait till you know, now, roughly 39 or 40. I wish I didn't, because I could only imagine where I would be. Um, and that's my gift to you. That's why I'm here. Not only to talk about property management and asset management, but give you some secrets that I wish someone told me. So take it, don't forget it, and work on it. Deal? Yeah. And you'll love me forever. <laughs> you guys rock. With that, any questions, comments? Yeah. Thank you. Isn't that a cool story? Crazy. It's real smart. Can we go down and, walk and check out the drive? Yeah, go out to the drive it. Take it out. Okay. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> no questions, comments? Um, someone trying to get into the industry, how would you recommend they get started? Okay, good question. Utilize your network. This certificate program, people just like myself are, are teaching these things, we're accessible. Utilize your network. Figure out what's what part of the industry you want to go to and get on and make it happen, right? Don't take no for an answer at the end of the day. A lot of you guys have my business card. I have more if you want it. Um, I'm. We're all guilty of it, right? If you see an email, and Lord knows what we're doing during the day, and then the email gets stacked up on, and then I may not respond. It's the meaning you give it. Are you going to say, oh, you didn't respond, so I'm not going that route? No. Give it the meaning that, you know what? He didn't see it. He got busy. I'm going to go after them again and again and again. That's the that's how you get in the industry. Don't stop. Fair.
Good question. And that's my advice to everyone. Since you've been in the industry, what would you say uh, is changed? Wow, well, it's uh, in so many ways. Um, back in the day, right, you would just put a sign out in front of an apartment building, you know, for rent with a phone number. Um, now you've got online reputation, you got websites, you got all the marketing sites like apartments.com, and there's you know 15 others uh, for that. By the way, one one idea, well, I'll finish the question. So it's changed from marketing, all the technology we talked about back in the day, they would use rent cards, handwritten, who paid what, right? Now it's all uh, software um, technology, um, all the KPIs. Um, I'll also answer that question with the two biggest issues the industry faces right now, at least on the multifamily side. Number one, interest rates. Don't ever over leverage. A lot of people, developers, they did not plan interest rates going from three to, to over six, right? Uh, almost touching eight at one point. So they didn't think interest rates would double in the time period it did. So that just means their debt, their cost of money doubled, and they weren't expecting it. So we've actually taken over properties operation for lenders because they went to the lenders, developers walked away. So you never want to find yourself in that situation. Don't over leverage yourself. Be careful on that. Um, so interest rates is a big issue in the in the industry and insurance uh, is a big in, uh, issue in the industry. I think it's really statewide, but specifically in Southern California, insurance rates are double or tripling. And so, you know, we talk about those costs of operating. Um, that's hurting a lot of people. A lot of successful people with those interest rates are walking away from buildings. It's crazy. It's crazy. So don't so don't over leverage. But those are the two main issues uh, that the industry is facing now. Does that answer your question on how things have changed? Yeah. I think level of service too in apartments, right? It's more like a hotel expectation now. You know, get up here now. Come upstairs. I need I need something. Uh, expectation. So that's the that's the challenge that Brian touched on. Um, what else was I going to mention? Any other questions? I think I, I forgot what I was going to say. Go ahead. We had who's the guy? We had a um, a private equity. Who's a private equity guy who came and spoke to us last year? So I think so. It was with one of those big. Thirty billion dollars. It was Aries Capital Management. I don't know the name. Oh, that was the piece. They were here. That was for finance society. That's what. Was. I think we're bringing them back though. Okay. I talked about that when I go. Over this um, time. you talked about, and I keep keep hearing the expression, the maturity wall of leverage that's coming our way. Talking about, I guess all these commercial property loans are all going to start coming due in the next two three years, right. something like that. Kind of in the same way that. With the Great Recession, all the mortgages rates flipped up on like one, on like one the same month or whatever it was. Right. That that's coming that way. Are you guys? It's like you have some commercial properties. What is it? What are your thoughts on on that? Are you going to handle it? Are you going to wait and like hope stuff opens up and just start snatching things up? Or are you going to? What yeah. Do you think? So you're right. And does that make sense to everyone? This. Uh maturity way that they're talking about usually in commercial real estate your debt terms are a lot five seven year money which means fixed rate when that time comes you got to refi into a whatever the current rate is so basically they're saying you have all this cheap money that's going to become due on valuations that are probably less right with especially office occupancy issues so you're going to have some people uh underwater uh, so to speak with the with the new rates so in any time of I guess you could call it a reset in, in some in some respects with values. It becomes a nightmare for whoever's owning. If they're over leveraged, if they've owned it for a while, low tax basis, you know, not huge debt on it, they'll be fine. If anyone tell everyone will tell you a lot of experienced folks, it's just to watch your leverage. You know, don't go over so you could weather the storm, as they say. Some people won't be able to weather the storm. So there will be people walking away from these buildings. Um, which, so it's a nightmare for, for current owners, depending on when they bought and how much, how much debt they have on the buildings. But one person's nightmare is someone else's dream, unfortunately, but there's going to be a huge opportunity, uh, for people to come in and buy these assets at a, at a lower rate. And it's kind of the, uh, the value reset, right? So let's just use office. Cause that seems to be the, the, the big one that everyone's talking about. If someone bought it for a hundred million. And now it's worth 50, their loan comes up, they're gone. 
right? The lender doesn't want to be in the, the ownership business, so they're going to sell it for the new value of 50. That tax basis just went way down, so that new owner has a new uh, new value, new basis for leasing, and all their leases are going to be lower because they don't have a big you know, debt uh, payment to, to deal with like some others are. So they're, they're going to have lower rents than all the other buildings. You're going to have occupancy issues. You get the idea. It's a cycle. So save money, get a group together, and be ready to buy in 12 to 18 months. Do you manage uh, buildings for financial institutions? Sure. Do you do that business? Like, we took over this building. Can you guys run it until we sell it? No doubt. Yeah. yeah. Are you guys plotting for this possible, you know? Yeah, we've uh, yeah, almost by default. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but then, but then, you're right, we started to focus on it more. Our, our business development team. Um, we, I want to say, there's probably eight apartment buildings, uh, new construction that were over leveraged that they walked away from that we're working with. You know, the lenders now. A lot of the lenders uh, are in New York, so then we'd be their operator, and then all the lenders know each other. So we get all the calls now for operations. So it ends up becoming an opportunity for us yeah. to gain business of operations. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Do you see like any benefit to being like a new developer versus somebody who just like acquired property? Because to me, like being a new developer, like by the time you're done a project, like, the world is really different. Like it just seems like how do you plan? Well, especially now, right? Um, ask a developer probably five years ago, and they're making money hand over fist, most likely. Now, you're, some developers are walking away. So I think if you ask a developer, they're going to say, oh, yeah, develop, right? You ask a surgeon, they're going to cut, right? Um, me, I'm more risk adverse, right? Where I would not, it's not for me. I'll say that. Um, but some people that do it all the time, you know, they're experts. And so that's why they do it. I wouldn't do it just because I don't have enough knowledge. And it, it does seem like there could be a lot to lose if things don't go right, especially at today's interest rates and spreads and returns as the, as the industry starts to turn a little bit. If you have flat or de uh, decline in rent growth, right? Or uh, rent values, all of a sudden they don't pencil. We take over for a lot of developers, not take over, we're hired by developers. To, and it's funny, usually owners tell, ask us what the values are, right? And we go to the comps and, and give them, here's the range that we could get. Developers tell us what the values are because they're backing the numbers that they need for their returns, right? It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So, um, but if you ask a developer, they could probably answer it better, but certainly not for me. I won't touch it. Any other questions? All right. Uh, do you have uh, Do you have anything? You got to close it up, right? I do. You're done. I All do. right. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate the time, and I think we're early. Like,